35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the, at the, <coughs> and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them? Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Can I invite Philip to come up? And uh, Philip's going to share the word with us. Let's just pray before he does. Father God, we know that your word is a, a living thing, a two-edged sword. And we ask, Lord, that we will be open-eared and open-hearted and willing to respond to what Philip has prepared for us this morning, that you will anoint his lips and open our hearts. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. <laughs> so good morning. My name is Philip, and I'm part of the church family here at St. Paul's. And many of you know that I'm now an ordinant. So, <laughs> not yet, not just yet. Wait until the end, maybe. Um, so whilst I've preached here before, this is my first sermon since officially starting training. So whilst I'm now no longer an amateur, I am now an official amateur. So, and it's, it's genuinely a privilege to be with you this morning uh, to share my thoughts with you. And it's fallen to me to finish off our series on discipleship and this week, our attention turns to that uncompromising, yet reassuring tornado of a gospel attributed to Mark. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, Mark has always been one of my favorite books. I think mainly because the disciples are so often described as complete failures, and I can very much relate to that. But I think they continually get stuff wrong because they're constantly having their worldview challenged. And as that deeply profound worship song says, it is a topsy-turvy, curly-whirly, crazy kind of place. And the commentator John Fenton describes Mark's gospel as all things counter, original, spare, and strange. And I'd just like you to keep those words in mind as we begin to look at what it means to be a disciple through being a servant. But before we delve into the passage, I just want to share a story with you I heard recently. So, a young missionary in his first post is sent to Canada, a small town just inside the Arctic Circle, with only just a few thousand people in it. And he decides that every Friday, he's going to hold a Bible study group, kind of life group, in the upstairs room in the community hall. And every night, Every Friday night, he turns on the lights, sets up the chairs, lays out cups with orange squash in, a few digestive biscuits, and every Friday night, no one comes. He sings a couple of songs to himself, drinks the squash, puts the chairs away, and turns off the lights. And this goes on for nearly the whole year. Then, two weeks before he's about to return home, He's sitting there. 
about to sing a few songs to himself when the door creaks open and a face hesitantly peers into the room, looks around and asks, is this where the bingo is? Oh, no, sorry, that's where you find that downstairs. Thanks very much. Uh, and so this young missionary comes to the end of his year, having had no one turn up to his Bible study group. And at the end of his time there, various people are thanking him for all that he's done. And then one of them says, you know, Rupert, let's call him Rupert. Rupert, we've watched you on Friday nights. Go up to that room and turn the light on. Stay for two hours and then turn the light off again without fail every week. And that has meant so much to us. Because although no one came, as long as that light was on in the dark and the cold, we knew you hadn't given up on us. And you're the first missionary in 30 years who hadn't given up hope and kept the light on for us. See, Rupert was completely unaware of the impact this small gesture was having. And if you remember that description of Mark's gospel, what Rupert was doing was utterly counter, original, spare, and strange. And it would have been so easy for him to have stopped, to have given up hope, thought that what he was doing was a waste of time, embarrassed by what the town was thinking of him. Yet that small, countercultural act of service made a huge impact in that small community and gave people that most precious gift, hope of being seen and feeling loved. And our success is often measured by status, you know, wealth, influence, isn't it? And if you count success in terms of attendance, Rupert's study group was an abject failure. But within the kingdom of God, it was an immeasurable success. And throughout this chapter in Mark, success and power and position are redefined. Jesus shows us a path of humble service that stands counter to what the world thinks it should look like. So if you've got your Bibles or your phones, whatever, let's, let's begin to look at this chapter. And I'm going to look at the whole chapter, um, not just verses 35 to 45, if you bear with me. So in verse 32, Mark tells us that Jesus and the disciples are on the way to Jerusalem for what will be the last time. We're about to head into Palm Sunday and Holy Week with Jesus being heralded as the liberator of Jerusalem. And he will be, just not in the way that his followers think it will be. And it's interesting that Mark uses the phrase, the way, here. Because before the second century, the way was the term for Christianity before the word Christianity was even coined. So Mark is literally saying to the disciples, they are on a physical journey to the city where the ultimate victory will take place. And he's also saying, metaphorically, to us, the reader, this is the new way to live that Jesus is teaching. And I think it's important to look at this exchange between James and John and Jesus within the context of the whole chapter because it's, it is really very rich and each story informs the next. <clears throat> so at the beginning of the chapter, chapter 10, Jesus is asked about divorce. And in verse 9 he says, What God has joined together, let, not, let, let man not separate. So he's grounding the sanctity of marriage in the authority of God. But it's also possible that this passage is saying something about discipleship. And in a similar way to when we marry, we leave our parents and build a new life with our spouse, God has taken those disciples from their families and united them with Jesus. And he won't go back on what he's done. God will not allow anything to break that fellowship between Jesus and his disciples. And then we come to the passage, which in this church we're all very familiar with, where the disciples are stopping the children from coming to Jesus in the temple. 
And in verse, te- verse 11, he says, do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And if you remember, in society at that time, children were seen as unimportant. They had no status, no skills. They had nothing to offer. But they are the only people in Mark's gospel that Jesus hugs. And as I've said, they've got nothing to offer, yet the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. And finally, we have the story of the rich man asking what he can do to to inherit eternal life. And the answer, let go of everything that is important to you. And the rich man knows he can't do this. And then Jesus says one of the most famous lines in the Bible, in verse 25, he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples are shocked. This is radical. Because traditionally, being rich and healthy were a sign that God had blessed your life. So the new teaching, the new way that Jesus is giving states that there is nothing that we can do to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 27, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. So we have to empty ourselves of all that is important to us and live a life shared with Jesus so that we can have a new, eternal life as adopted children of our Father in heaven. But what I'd not noticed before is that in verse 21, Jesus looks at the rich man and he loves him. Some versions say his heart warmed to him. See, this wretch man is self-aware enough to know that he can't do what Jesus is asking. And Jesus sees his pain and loves him anyway. And then Jesus tells the disciples for the third and last time how he's going to die. Only this time it's far more graphic. He's saying how he's going to be betrayed, humiliated, spat on, flogged, and killed. And it's straight after this that James and John sidle up to Jesus and say, we want to sit at your right and your left hand. We want positions of power and authority once you've liberated Jerusalem. And I don't know about you, but I've always thought that James and John are being really quite insensitive. (coughs) Jesus has just told them how gruesome the next few days are going to be. And they think, yeah, yeah, no, we hear you. It's going to be hard, yeah, but, but it's going to be glorious. And we want to be in places of honor right next to you. They haven't grasped the reality of what's about to happen. They don't understand the way that Jesus is teaching, the new way that Jesus is teaching. They're still thinking in purely worldly terms. They want positions of power. They want to sit beside him in glory without having paid attention to what Jesus has been saying throughout the previous chapter. How God has authority over our relationships. How wealthy children with no status really are. And how poor are the rich. They haven't understood how counter, original, spare, and strange these teachings are. And as Tom Wright says, they want Jesus without the cross. And I just wonder how often do we prioritize our own achievements, our own status, or recognition over what it means to be a disciple that truly serves A disciple that seeks to be the greatest through being the least. And if we're being honest, how much our own pride gets in the way of a relationship with Jesus. Henri Nguyen, I don't know if you've heard of him. He was a priest and a professor of divinity at Harvard. He he was the the head of the, 
the department at Harvard, and he'd previously taught at Yale. See, this was a guy at the top of his game. He was leading and teaching some of the brightest minds in the world. And he chose to leave the world of academia and be a priest at a community for people with intellectual dis disabilities called the Last Daybreak Community in Canada. And he wrote about how very quickly he had to drop the idea that he was going into that community to lead as he realized he was the one being led and was learning much more about God's love from the people there. And in later life, he wrote, I came face to face with the simple question. Did becoming older bring me closer to Jesus? After 25 years of priesthood, I found myself praying poorly, living somewhat isolated from other people, and very very much preoccupied with burning issues. Everyone was saying how, everyone was saying that I was doing really well. But something inside was telling me that my success was putting my own soul in danger. So is our own idea of success getting in the way of following Christ? And going back to our reading, at this point, the disciples are furious with James and John. They're indignant. And it's not quite clear why, but I wonder if it's because they were jealous. Were they trying to sideline other disciples? Is this a power play to demote Peter? Well, who knows? And in some senses, it's not really important. But what is important is that any notion of glory or success, or personal ambition, must be replaced by being a servant. Jesus says in verse 43, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Slave of all. Not just your mates or your family, but all. Because in verse 45 it says, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And this is echoed by Paul in Philippians chapter 2 when he writes in that beautiful poem. He writes that Jesus, and I paraphrased here, he writes that Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So when Jesus says to James and John, can you dr drink the cup I drink from and be baptized with the baptism I shall be baptized with, this is what he means. I and mean, we can be a bit hard on James and John. But they do understand in the end. You know, James will end up being martyred, as will Peter. As do people in the persecuted church today. And if you're worried that I'm painting too bleak a picture, let's take a quick look at what happens next in the story. Because they meet blind Bartimaeus, who doesn't need his sight to know that Jesus is the Son of God. And all he says is, have mercy on me. I want to see. And immediately, Jesus heals him. And what does Bartimaeus do? He gets up and follows Jesus on the way. So yes, if we want to be followers of Jesus, we must follow him on the way to the cross, where he emptied himself in the ultimate act of service for each one of us. But he is also the healer, the reconciler, the restorer. And in a moment, we're going to take communion where we symbolically remember what Jesus did for us. So as we approach the cross, beaten and broken, but in taking the bread and wine, and through his resurrection, 
we're made whole. So next week, we come into Advent, where we celebrate Jesus' coming into the world. But if we're honest, you know, it's also a festival that's, that's come to mean something completely different, isn't it? To most people that we come across. A festival of consumerism and all of indulgence. And many people have never even thought of the incarnation, let alone what it actually means. And so I'd just like to, to leave you with the idea that to the people you work with, live with, meet in the street, you may be the only Bible they will ever read. So how are we going to serve others in a way that is truly counter original, spare, and strange. See, Rupert stayed obedient and kept the light on, not knowing what it meant to other people. So who are you going to keep the light on for? Allow that word to sink in a little bit before we move on. Who are you going to keep the light on for? It's an interesting thought, isn't it? Um, the only thing you can bring to the kingdom is your faithful service. And that is often effective in ways that you don't even appreciate. Like that missionary keeping his light on for two years. But what you are called to do is be salt and light in the world. So maybe as we go into communion, as you bring uh, yourself to the front there and partake of those elements and emblems, you might want to just recommit yourself to Jesus and say, lead me into the way where I can be that light. Just in the places that you've called me, not to do anything spectacular or special, but in the places and the corners of the world that you send me to be that light. So let us focus our thoughts on Jesus. That's what this meal is all about. Uh, every single one of you is invited to come forward when we get to that point.